I am very pleased today um, to introduce someone that I absolutely adore. Um, homegrown, a homegrown leader of social justice, um, a visionary, an implementer, born to lead, born in Spokane, Washington, um, about the same time I was. I won't tell you what year. <laughs> so I am very pleased to um, introduce to you um, Ron Sims. As I said, someone that I completely uh, admire and adore, homegrown, our own leader, someone who understands and walks the talk. In fact, when he was King County exec, he did so much in the way of health equity uh, with all of the divisions under his sphere of influence. I have used Seattle and what he did in King County as an example of what is possible. And so he has not only done this work here, but he has encouraged others to see what's possible so that they could follow his example. So please help me welcome to the podium our homegrown leader, visionary, someone we all love and adore, Ron Sims. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you're all way, way too kind, but thank you very, very, very much. The, uh, it was hard for me to believe that Julie had been here for 25 years because people who look like they're 22, you know, I wanna know what the secret was, I really do. And, uh, but th Julie, thank you for everything that you've done for 25 years, it's been really amazing. And uh, Maxine, we were in this room once, and, it, and there were only two of us that were on the side that I wanted to take, you and myself, and the room was filled, um, and people did not welcome what we were doing, which was a pretty simple issue. It was on dental services, and the issue of the fact that so many, we were looking at second graders, and who were on subsidized lunch, and found out that second graders that 32% of second graders on subsidized lunch had eight active decaying teeth. And we were stunned by that. And our issue was how were we going to mobilize and resolve that issue? And we actually have no idea how many times we raised tough issues and they were not welcome. And it gets really lonely, <laughs> really lonely. And you were just always there. You never back down. And I used to say, if she's not gonna back down, I'm taller, <laughs> I am bigger, and I am not gonna back down either. And then you retired, and I all of a sudden, that's why I gave you a big hug this morning. I said, oh, golly, she can't leave because she's provided, you know, like the lioness blanket, you wrapped yourself around it, and you, so thank you for being the blanket. And I'm glad that you are still so actively involved in healthcare because you, you, know, you are f amazing. And thank you. You're just amazing. <laughs> I'll tell you two stories. Uh, one is that people said, you know, I, what was your favorite job? I said, King County Executive. And they said, why did you then? go back to Washington, D.C., and I'll tell you how that happened. Um, the, uh, I got a call at the, uh, the, presiden the Presidential Transition Committee called my office, and they, uh, my staff got the call, and I said, hang up. <laughs> and they said, why? I said, I'm running for another term. I know that's a reporter trying to say that I wanted to do something other than be King County exec. So they called back. And he said, no, we really are the President's Transition Committee. I said, I told my staff, give them to security, so security will validate it. 
So the security staff came over and said, no, that's, that's them. So I said, oh, okay. So I got on the phone. And my whole goal was I had been elected for three terms. I was considered to be a senior executive in the country. And so I really wanted to tell them, which I did, the various issues that large governments face and gave them a series of names of people who I thought would be good for them to hire because it would be really nice for people like me to go back to Washington, D.C. for the first time over eight years to be able to talk to somebody who knew what we were talking about and understood our issues. I just wanted, I said, you have no idea what it's like to go back to Washington, D.C. and realize that the person across from you is already at no. So that conversation took about 35 minutes, and they said, thank you very much. Then they called back, and they said, um, we'd like for you to come back and meet with staff on the issues that you raised on the phone. So I said, OK. So I wrote them all down, and my staff prepared this big briefing book. I mean, it was I read that briefing book and read it. I said, I had one shot, one shot to be able to influence a new president. My God, I was going to do it. So I remember mastering all transportation, health care, climate change, air quality issues, urban planning, <laughs> disparity issues, you name it. We had this whole thing. I was mastering the details, like being in a college exam, you know, and you read and you reread it and you reread it. And so then I remember getting on the plane and they said to me, now you remember you cannot tell anybody you're here to, to brief the president. I was like, oh, no, no, no problem. I won't, I, I won't tell anybody. So you get on the plane then uh, you go up to the 31st floor and I'm sitting there with a condensed version of my briefing book going over it. I said, wow, these people are really smart. They're going to bring me into this large room of all these people who are going to pepper me and my issue is to feel very confident and try to influence their decision. So I'm sitting there, really focused, and the door opens, and it's President-elect Obama. And I'm going, OK. He says, oh, come on, come on back. So we were walking down the hall. I said, oh, this is going to be great. We've got the President-elect and this whole room full of people. I said, Ron, do not be stupid. You are already starstruck. Just do not be stupid. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I walk into his office. And he says, have a seat. But there are a variety of chairs. And I didn't know which one was his. <laughs> so I didn't move. And he took a few more steps. He looked around. He said, no, sit anywhere. So I moved toward the seating area, but made no commitment. <laughs> and um, then he said to me, um, he turned around, and he laughed. He said, sit anywhere. I promise you, I will not sit in your lap. <laughs> so I sat down. And then he came over and sat right next to me. Right. So we talked for about, I think, 45, 50 minutes on a variety of issues. Then he said to me, I hear you want a job in my administration. I said, no, Mr. President, uh, I am uh, intending to run for another term. And he said, I had this odd, puzzled look, and he says to me, but if I ask you to work for me, if I ask, what would you say? I said, Mr. President, has anybody told you no? He says, I don't know. Has anybody told me no? <laughs> the, um, so shortly thereafter, I got on the phone and said to my wife, I just made a career change. The, um, <laughs> in Washington, D.C. was a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, but I still love being here. I still love being home. My wife made it really clear that I would be on the East Coast and she would be on the West Coast. Um, and uh, I didn't know whether that was being punted out of the house or she, as she pointed out, she lived back there once and once was enough. Uh, but it was a fabulous, fabulous place. The, uh, the same way happened when Governor Inslee called me really early in the morning, because people know I'm an early riser. So if you want me, you know me, you're going to call me between 7 and 8 o'clock, because I'm an early riser. And uh, so I get a call, and I said, the governor's office is on the phone. And I'm going, um, OK. So then Jay gets on the phone, and he says to me, I, I want you to be the health benefit exchange chair. So I said to him, Governor, this, my reaction, this, Take a second. I said, one, I thought we were on good terms. And, <laughs> and two, I thought you liked me. The, um, but it's been an honor to serve with an incredibly talented staff. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what I always call the various things that are happening in healthcare today and why it is such a wonderful time, but how extraordinary the challenges still remain. 
if you look at the health benefit exchange, and we, you know, and when you're on the board and when you're in the state, we get, you know, say we're not perfect yet, and we need to get to perfect. And yet we went to a meeting this over this week, and everybody says to us, we want to be where you are. And I was going to go, but well, we don't want to be where we are. We want to be up here. But it was nice to know that the exchange has enrolled more people than anywhere else in the country, especially on Medicaid, as a, as a percentage of population. <laughs> that is considered to be actually quite, quite, quite successful. And so we can smile. So I tell people, OK, we can smile for a few minutes and then get perfect later, but we will get perfect. But you know, there's, so I always said that the, the benefit of the Affordable Care Act is that we are insuring people. And that's really important. P and many of the people were not previously insured. We're providing insurance coverage. I feel very, very strongly that a civilized nation and a great one makes sure that no one goes without health care. I am absolutely convinced of that. Years ago, when I was uh, wanting to be a chaplain and go into, so I was thinking about going to a divinity school, I remember uh, being a volunteer at Harborview Hospital, and people said, what was the best teacher you ever had at Harborview Hospital? It was an incredible, incredible teacher. Because there you realize winners and losers. You realize that you had people who, because of the public's desire to support a system, were able to get health care that would otherwise not be provided to them, whether it was in the burn center, whether it was in the trauma center, whether it was upon 9C. The most magnificent love I ever seen between two people was a man whose wife would no longer be able to receive radiated treatment for her brain cancer. And he was there every day. And at first, um, they would talk. And then she couldn't speak anymore, but she would say a thousand things to him by her smile and her eyes. And then she lost her hearing, so you know she was reading his lips and he would still hold her. And then she couldn't hear anymore. She couldn't see anymore. And he was there every day. Every day. I will never forget what that love looked like and what it felt like. But it was better there than any place else. Better in an environment where you had health care support, really wonderful nurses, really, really great docs, doing everything they could to try to change the tide that would, is going to be inevitable, and yet at the same time inspired us, whether we were chaplains, whether we were just visitors, to understand the dignity that people must have at the beginning of their life and at the end of life. That's what the ACA provides, and that's what people committed to health care provide. So I will talk about all the equity components. You know, one thing that um, uh, we now know today is that uh, even in, we cannot say that we have resolved the issues of equity in the delivery of health care services. Matter of fact, I am fascinated by a lot of the discussions today. I was reading the paper today, and everybody's having a big debate over affordable housing. And I look and say, I have yet to hear one time since I've been back, once, just once, I'd like to hear once, just once, <laughs> just even a microsecond for somebody to say that you will not ever move anybody into a community and into a neighborhood that is not a healthy neighborhood by design and by measurement. We continue to shuttle people off and say, oh, let's just give them affordable housing. Let's just put them in this housing without realizing that the most impactful thing we know today, neighborhoods kill more people in this country than any other causal factor of death. We sat down with, a, I remember going to the CDC, and I was always called, this guy's crazy. But the CDC, Dr. Howard Frumpkin, who's now the Dean of Public Health at University of Washington, actually believed what I said. So he convened this group in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was going, woo, these people got some serious resumes. So I thought maybe I would just shuttle off my deputy side and sit there very quietly. And, and all of a sudden, these people were producing all this information. And the information said that if you want to die, it's the neighborhood you're going to be in. It will determine with your lifetime earnings of children, your morbidity rates, diseases and illnesses you will get, and their very treatment. And the idea was the CDC was to say, we needed to look at the built environment because it's so determinative. It's not only the house you live in, whether or not it has toxics in it, whether it has any kind of toxics in it, whether it has you know, 
bad things in it, but even your neighborhood determines whether or not you're going to be healthy or not. I was in Los Angeles and we were in a group and uh, somebody said, why don't African-American senior citizens walk in Latino neighborhoods? I mean, is there a cultural gap? And I said, I have no idea. I, do you, I would just get rid of all the 90, I would get rid of all the 90 degree corners you have in that neighborhood and see what happens. Anybody said, what? I said, you know, 90 degree corners. You know, you, if you're a senior citizen, you want to see around the corner, you can't, there's no 90 degree, there's no 90 degree corners in nature, just see. So all of a sudden I get a call from City Hall and they say, wait, what? We found a neighborhood where we could actually create bulbs or we could get people to modify their frontage so that the 90 degree corners were gone. And it's true. People started walking. We began to see African Americans walking in Latino neighborhoods. I said, right. He said, but the Latino elderly started walking too. And I said, yeah, well, if you can't run fast, you want to see around the corner. And I said, so, he said, we want $10 billion. Trying to put it no, 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 no. We can't go there. But our issue was very clear. The built environment determines whether you walk or not. It's pretty simple. If you want people to walk, you don't all of a sudden have, a, there's no 90 degree corners in nature. We're used to it. So we want to see around the corner, whether we can see through, as some people are designing, so you can see on one side of the street through the windows to the other side of the street. There are no hiding places if you want people. So neighborhoods by design. The other is wider sidewalks are clearly preferable, clearly preferable to narrow neighborhood, narrow sidewalks. And especially when you're my age, because you want distance between you and young drivers like my children. So, the, um, <laughs> so I love them. Trust me, I, I love them. I, I've always loved them. I like them now because they're financially, emanci because they're financially emancipated from me. But nonetheless, <laughs> their speed and control is much different than mine. You know, Dad, Dad you drive while slow. Which is afraid, Dad, you drive while old. I, I, hey, that's OK. I want a wide sidewalk. The, um, but we know that senior citizens and other, and children in particular, feel more comfortable and safer when a sidewalk's wide. The Department of Justice came to us and they said, you know, we have this interesting result. We found out that taking the same demographics and putting them in two different neighborhoods resulted in two different crime rates. That people in areas where it was green, where they had parks, com community gardens, uh, trees, flowers, and all that, they said, the crime rate in those neighborhoods was 70% lower than it was in neighborhoods who had were absent those qualities. Uh, you know, Mr. Deputy, what do you think? What's causing that? I said, well, we, we evolved in the grasslands. <laughs> so you saw this, well, I, what? And I said, well, we, as a species, we evolved in grasslands. Canyons were always where our predators had advantages. And they said, oh, we cannot take that back to Attorney General. <laughs> I said, well, then ask your consultants how to figure it out what the arm is. But I want to tell you, though, that there are several areas that we still have to address in regards to equity, which is if we do not build healthy homes and we don't build healthy neighborhoods, we will fail in the long run to have healthy populations. You have to adjust those. People will say, well, what about desert islands? No matter what the desert island or not, it will, if the neighborhood is not designed and a fashion that is healthy. And the big absence of discussion on affordable housing that I read this morning, and the huge stress on affordable housing, are the fact that they are no longer discussing because everybody assumes that every neighborhood in the metropolitan area of King County is a healthy one, and it is not. King County's data, thanks to Maxine in so many ways, tells us that we have huge disparities in neighborhoods by design. Seattle Times said a piece, of, a piece that said, where are all the trees? Well, all the trees were in neighborhoods that are healthy. The lack of trees were in neighborhoods that were poor. They never said that. They just said some neighborhoods have a lot of trees, some neighborhoods have a lot of trees, and other neighborhoods don't. But we can determine, quite frankly, the lifetime earnings of children and health outcomes from children and adults by those neighborhoods. Now, there's an, an interesting story that's come out now on epigenetics, which I find really fascinating. I was in Washington, I was down in, at USC, and the, one of the panelists started bringing up epigenetics. And, I loved her and I wanted to talk about her points, not everybody else's ideas, because she, nobody kind of understood what she was saying. She says, I'm an epigeneticist, and da 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 da. But all epigenetics is that our genes are not constant. We've always assumed they are. They are not constant, they change all the time. Our DNA that we thought was rock solid also kind of misbehaves and does strange things onto us. 
And so we realize that we are a product, everybody in this room is a product of the genes that were of your great grandparents. You inherit those. And you respond to their stresses that they saw when their great grandparents, my great grandparents were slaves. So that's what I would inherit. What epigenetics allows us to do is to make a different signal that alters what our genes do and therefore our responses. So let's talk about early childhood education. We have so many thrusts on early childhood education that we have these kids come in and we say every kid should learn. I've, I've heard that till the cows come home. But we realize that a kid who comes with stress factors in their life learns differently in a way that means that they're not going to test well or learn at all. You remove the stress and the kid learns. If the stress is present, they don't. We don't even talk about those because that means that we have to rethink who we are and what we do and the neighborhoods that we put people in. You are never ever going to have effective delivery of educational services pre-kindergarten or in kindergarten or in school until you fundamentally change the neighborhoods. So that's why I like, when you talk about equity, that's what I love because you're reminding people that there are inequities and doggone this country has to realize there are inequities in every single community with you're a liberal or conservative, in eastern Washington or western Washington, whether you're in a metropolitan area of Seattle or whether you're in Palsbo or Vancouver or Walla Walla or Yakima or Spokane, that all those designs in those neighborhoods are basically forming the basis of which people will respond for the rest of their lives. So that's what the factors of epigenetics are. So we know from the science of our genes, we know from outcomes that we can measure medically, that equity and inequities are built in to how we deliver services and, and, how we, and, and what we tolerate in regards to what peop how people live. So when I look at the Health Benefits Exchange, I always say to people, it's really interesting. One, it's an amazing group. So I gave a speech and I said to somebody, you know what my biggest challenge is? is I do want everybody to have health care insurance. Trust me, I really do. But what I also want to see happen is I don't want to pay for illness. And that's what we're doing. I would love to see a system change so our insurance companies were incentivizing wellness. People said, what happened in King County? I said, well, it was pretty interesting in King County. We had a, a, a discussion on what we should do for our employees, and somebody said premium share. And I had a rule in, in King County. You could tell me I was wrong publicly. You had two weeks to correct it, though, by having me another, another solution. So the guy named Jim Lopez says, you are wrong. And they always called me boss out of affection because I never had that authority. You, you're wrong. So I said, OK, Jim. So he comes back and says, let's bring the experts in and make a decision. What would they offer? So we sent letters out to 22 experts, and they all came in, and they didn't even talk to me the first meeting because they were, never had gathered as a group. But what they did after meeting every two weeks was to provide us something that was absolutely great, which is to say to us, rethink health care rather than illness, stress wellness. So I remember adopting the plan. With, you know, our unions were really, really great. Our employees were really, really great. And I remember that it, it asked for a test. You had a, you had a private thing you had to fill out that somebody would measure. So mine said, you had to be, Ron, you must be seven foot two, considering the weight you have. So I said, uh, I'm not seven foot two, so I guess it's saying I'm morbidly obese. But that's <laughs> it's neither here nor there. I wasn't insulted. I didn't hate them. I said, my wife said, uh, she said, this, what do you think about this, t this thing you have to fill out? And I said, well, you know, it's pretty thorough. She says, no, it's pretty invasive. But nonetheless, what happened in King County? If you look at King County right now, their medical age, their health age is 39. The average age of the employee is 53. When they're 63 years old, they're going to be the healthiest 63-year-olds in the state. Why? Because we said insurance should not wait for you to be sick. It should encourage you to be well. And so the insurance industry, rather than <laughs> rather than wait for me to be sick, I want the insurance industry to flip over and give me an economic model that says, you know you save the society more. 
I mean, we still talk about the fact that, it, that healthcare has been reduced to 7% cost growth. Excuse me, there is nothing growing in the country faster than healthcare today. It'll still be enormous, and the data tells us it's going to get worse. So what we know is that this his big bulge is coming, and many of that big bulge is out of the neighborhoods that you are fighting for today. That when that big bulge hits type 2 diabetes at 42 years of age, the medical system, as we understand it, can't not afford it. It collapses. And so people said, what happens then? I said, then we begin the hard decisions, telling people they're not going to get care because we can't afford it anymore. Our economy can't. Our resources can't. And that is fast approaching. So I want wellness. I remember another one. They said to me, uh, I, they asked for us to take age group tests, age group tests. And those are really important, prostate exams, colonoscopies, breast e exams. Um, I can't remember, there were several others. And so I remember having to go, I said, oh, I'll lead. So I remember having to take a particular exam. And they said to me afterwards, they said, oh, Mr. Sims, you have to tell everybody you took this exam. I said, you are out of your mind. Yeah, my results were great, but you are out of your mind. I said, well, 80% of all health care costs today are associated with catastrophic illnesses. And you made a decision to determine whether you had, might have one. I said, no, 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 you will not announce it. So King County employees, all 23,000, found out that Ron Sims had a colonoscopy. <laughs> um, I didn't want to brag about it. I didn't want to talk about it. But I it was smart. So you have to have a health insurance industry that makes sure that you're getting those age group tests and, and encouraging it, and you're getting wellness. Why is it so important on the equity side? Because the people who aren't getting those are the people who we see in our clinics. In the Eastside Clinic in King County, we had several things. The worst was that we had to figure out how to counsel our doctors and our nurses because they had so many people coming in with advanced breast cancer. You can do nothing. You can do nothing. And it has a wear and tear on any professional because you're looking at a human being and you're the one delivering the news. We also learn things culturally. People of other cultures, and particularly women, will never see themselves naked in front of a male of any kind. Not a male doc at all. Not a male nurse. They will not be touched by them because they're prohibited both by their religion and their culture from being touched or seen by another man other than her husband. So we had to learn to change how we approach people culturally and talk their language. So we said only women, only women docs, and only women nurses. And the advances that we made were because we were culturally smart. When I was at the, when we had a meeting at the HBE, and they were looking at languages, and I said to them, you know, we several times did a remarkable job one day. It put on the front page when people were fixating because they were bringing charcoal in their home, and they were Vietnamese. They said, whoa. It was beautiful. In every language possible, we had no drop in the fixations. So we went to the merchants and said to the merchants, can we post these notices telling people not to burn charcoal in their home? And they said, who are you wishing to reach? So we said, we're willing, we're trying to reach people who are burning charcoal in their home. They said, contact every family group you can and have them go out and deliver that message. And so we worked with the Vietnamese community in the way the Vietnamese community wanted to see people work with their culture and the fixation stopped. So we have to be sensitive to the fact that although we are changing very rapidly, every culture has its unique rules. Doctor's appointment, oh, I mean, tell you, doctor's appointment. My son said, well, all my East African friends, hey, a lot of them, text message. So everybody said, no, 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 they got to call the doctor and all that kind of, he said, I don't know about you, but my friends, text message. So he was asked to come in here as a volunteer intern one year and work with three King County Health and then two foundations. And everybody was figuring all these elaborate ways to communicate, go online and communicate appointment. And my son said, I just text message. So finally, <laughs> they brought in a group of consumers and just asked the question, how would you communicate a doctor appointment? They said, text message. <laughs> the world uses text message. If you've ever been where I have been, whether it's Africa or South America, when you're out in the Thule's, when you're wondering whether civilization just basically flew by in a hurry and nobody caught up, everybody still texts. Everybody still texts. 
And so our key when we address equity is to look at the depth of how people communicate, how their family systems are formed, and what they do, and then we'll have equity. So equity is not just a neighborhood issue and a design. It is a way of being culturally sensitive and respectful to the cultures. When you have a person who is Thai, and we say that's mental illness, and they say it's spiritual, you have to figure out a bridge that you take so you can make sure that that conduct you're seeing is going to be safe for them and people around them, but you don't di dismiss its spirituality. They're going to call it that whether you like it or not. The issue is it may be bright and clear mental illness, but my God, figure out a way to work through those bridges. So I admire everybody in this room because I wouldn't want your job. <laughs> you have the toughest jobs right now at the most remarkable period in U.S. history. You know, people don't like to talk about equity because everybody likes to talk about how things are well. You are the bearers of possibility, but not necessarily good news. You're the bearer of challenges, and you have successes, but sometimes they feel elusive, that you can't get your arms around them. But if you don't do it, nobody will. If you don't do it, nobody will respond. You've taken the hardest task in healthcare today. It isn't whether or not I can be HBA chair and see people getting insured. Oh, yes, that requires a lot of work. And it requires a lot of people on the ground doing their work. It requires a lot. But HBA only, HBE will only pay for illness. It will not resolve the issues of equity. You can look at your city councils and say to them, can you think about having health measures? Can you can look at people of other cultures and say, how do you want to empower them? You can look at people who are poor and who all of a sudden said, nobody listens to us. I was sharing with Dr. Hayes. I said to her, I saw a study yesterday, last week that just all of a sudden brought out every emotion to me. And I'll tell you in two closing stories, two or three. <laughs> First of all, when I was a kid in Spokane, Washington, to get to New York, you had to drive straight to New York because there was no law that required people to accommodate people who were black between Spokane and Minneapolis. So you packed your car and you got in that, filled that gas, and you could, you could get gas. You had no public, you couldn't even go to the restaurants. Nobody would feed you. You just packed food and you step in that car. And I remember because I saw a diesel train for the first time, because I grew up in the area of choo-choo trains. So I decided to get a closer look at the diesel train. So I opened the car door and out I flew and bounced off the rear tire. But panic ensued. I didn't know whether my parents knew I was out of the car. And I remember running to the car, waving. Don't, don't leave me here in North Dakota. Please. <laughs> and my father was saying to me, I kept saying, no, Lydia, you're headed to the drainage ditch. And she says, Ronald's outside. Ronald's outside. <laughs> so I remember my father scooped me up. We were turned down by three doctors in North Dakota. I thought out of the car door onto a roadway at 60 miles an hour on only three, doc three doctors turned us down. One doctor that told my parents he thinks the nuns will help me. And we went, I remember my mother holding me, and she was crying, and the nurses said, go around, the nuns said, go around the back, go around the back. I remember I had pictures to this day. I had bandages over my head. I had them on my elbows, my hands, my knees. I mean, I evidently was pretty pavement, and I did not agree <laughs> on my invincibility, so it took a lot. That's what happens when you don't have health care. My oldest brother, James, when I was really small, and my parents had gone shopping to the grocery store, I had an asthma attack. And I remember I was always told, dial zero. We were raised to dial zero. Whenever James had an asthma attack, dial zero. For so I dialed zero, and they came and took my brother. And I remember my parents coming back and saying, James is not going to be here for a while. Dr. Steer, Dr. Steer, had my brother sent to the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, Colorado. And after all of those years, I had an older brother for 54 additional years. The choices of healthcare are that stark. Some people can have access, and some people don't have access. And our issue is that we should always have a healthcare system that everybody has access to. So in the state of Washington today, according to a report that came to, your, to WSU's regions regarding a medical school, there are 49% of all the doctors are in the metropolitan area of King County, but we have counties in the state with no docs at all. We have 
doctors at ratios that are less than those provided Alabama's rural areas and Mississippi rural areas. That is unconscionable. We should never have a system that says you get and you don't. Health equity is not just community design. Health equity is not just our sensitivities to culture. Health equity is not just an issue of wellness. Health equity also ensures that no one, no one will be denied what we call the ability to access health care. You should never have North Dakotas where you have people like me being denied care. You should have places where you have what I was called like my brother's doc, Dr. Steer, where you can go there and somebody can also move you to your better health. So the challenges you have on equity are so amazing, so extraordinary, so big, so huge. But you know, somebody has to do them. So I will tell you in a closing story. When I was, I was in love in college. Everybody knows that. I was in, I was in love in college every day with somebody. I mean, I got to call and say, whoa, I'm being be in love, be in love, be in love, be in love. But the first person, I know what love is now. I really do. I know it's magnificence and how extraordinary it is. But the first time I ever really, really found myself in love was in college. And I will never forget it. It was, it was sweet. <laughs> I use words like succulent and other words, but I won't do that. It was really nice. And I can remember one day when... Um, she had, you know, I had, she said, why don't we have dinner? So, you know, I had Smokey Robinson playing on the hi-fi set, and Smokey, and Smokey was doing really well. And, and all of a sudden, she, I'm eating this dinner, and she comes, and she, she was sitting across from her, and she looks at me, and she says, um, um, I'm eating a pound cake. Now, everybody who knows me knows I love pound cakes. There is no mystery. You want me happy, you have a pound cake. There is no, that's what I do. I see, I, I can walk past a store and say, pound cake. The, uh, so she had a pound cake and I ate that pound cake a little bit and I was eating it and she said, oh, I forgot the sugar. I said, hey, 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 y'all the sugar this man will ever need. I followed her to Seattle. And um, like all things in life, all the most extraordinary plans don't always work out well. And we found ourselves going in different life tracks in different directions. She left Seattle, I stayed here. She flourished in her career in Ohio, and I flourished in my career here. So I saw her once again, and I remember we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked. It was just like nothing had ever stopped. So all of the ways in which we could look at each other and smile and laugh and recount, all of that just came. And she fell asleep, so I was walking away from her. I, I remember her saying, she's asleep now, and I kissed her on the cheek, and then I walked away, and I stopped and turned around. And I stared at her for a really long, long, long time. A really long time. She woke out of a very, very drowsy sleep, and she said, oh, come here, you silly man, come here, you silly man. So I, I took the first step, calm, relax. I took the second step, and I started crying. And when I got to her bedside, I just cried. She held me for a really, really, really long time and let me cry. And she, I'll never forget her words. She was a teacher, a wonderful teacher. And she said, my time has come, and my life has come to its end, but you have so much to do. So I would tell everybody in this room that a higher authority than any of you has determined that your task is noble, that your ta task is important, and is precious, and that'll make a difference. So I want to tell you that, that you've been given one more day, one more week, month, year and career to ensure that health equity is no longer a discussion of my granddaughter's generation, my very perfect granddaughter, <laughs> my really, really perfect granddaughter, 
who has now been joined by my really, really, really perfect grandson. I don't want their generation to talk about health equity. I want it to be so embedded, so much a part of the culture, that it's celebrated. So I want to thank all of you for your commitment to health equity in all of its forms, in all of its forms, because we have so much to do. Peace to you.